Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Surprise Jab Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Ruger, and as always, we will be surprising you with new topics and jabbing you with your daily dose of UFC. I like that intro. I think I think it's going to stick. I like it, you know, and kind of incorporates the fact that we'll be going over a number of topics, and I was always talking about UFC, because that's, that's what I specialize in, I feel. That's what I know most about. Um, we are live in studio right now recording this, and we'll be going over a number of topics today. Um, I actually have a lot that I um, was going to talk about, but I'm actually going to put that into a, sort of like a two-part thing. I'm going to be going over a majority of the UFC news in our next video, where we'll be previewing the upcoming fight night in London. But um, as for this episode, we will be uh, recapping the fight night between Holm and Silva. I know a bit, a li- bit late on the recap, but very late. Then never. We'll also be doing a special piece on what adrenaline is, what adrenaline is, how it basically pushes you through. the. It's basically the essential fight or flight response in the body, and we did a little research on that. I'll be happy to talk about that. Um, and we'll also be going over a bit of TV shows and a movie I just watched, all right? But um, as for your uh, little daily UFC information, um... We'll talk about the Ultimate Fighter, which actually went down last night, episode eight, and Conor McGregor finally got a win. His guy knocks out a uh, Hunter Azur. I can't really recall what McGregor's guy's name was. You know, at the end of the day, seven to one Chandler in the quarterfinals matchup. So, as it goes to the semifinals, McGregor will have one hope alive, I believe, in the bantamweight division. But um. I didn't really catch the whole episode. I caught bits and pieces. I actually saw the finish on uh, Instagram, so I actually have to go back and watch that episode because I uh, I love watching TV, and that's what I'm going to talk about next, as I recently watched the first four episodes of Too Hot to Handle, which I, I, I think it's good. I'm a big reality TV guy. You know, shows like F-Boy Island on HBO Max, Love Island on, gosh, whatever, whatever channel Love Island's on. I love that show. And man, I just find it so fascinating. Honestly, it honestly amazes me the way these people act on these shows. So basically, if no one knows what Too Hot to Handle is, the premise is they take, gosh, I think they start out with 10, 10 singles, five girls, five guys. They all say they're going to be on this big party show. You know, they're going to be they're gonna be drinking, sleeping around, just having a good time. And they tell them that they can't do anything sexual with anyone else on the show. And they have to form meaningful relationships, meaningful connections. And the way these people freak out about not being able to have intercourse, it just, it, it amazes me. I, And it's so funny, you know, it's one of those shows where you're like, I can't believe this is actually a big show on Netflix, but I've watched the last four seasons and this one is nonetheless more entertaining. And I just, I like those shows. Um, another show that I've recently been watching, a f- very popular one, is The Sopranos. You know, I haven't seen it in a minute, but I made it through the first five. Actually, I think I've been through uh, the first four four seasons i'm on season five right now um tony soprano love him i hope nothing bad happens to tony although i may or may not have seen the spoilers for the ending of the sopranos as it's rated as one of the worst tv finales of all time but nonetheless i'm rocking with the sopranos right now and a movie i saw recently i know it came out i believe last year but man was it so good puss in boots the last wish okay Scale of one to ten. We're gonna rank it. All right. Everyone, everyone, get your pencils, paper out. You're gonna write down your ranking too. All right. Three, two, one. Nine out of ten. That movie was amazing. Oh my goodness. I, I haven't watched any like children's or like anime movies in so long. But Puss in Boots: The Last Wish, so good. The animation style. I don't even know what it was, but it was amazing. DreamWorks rarely misses with their movies. Always so good. The dialogue, the dialogue for what is, I guess, what is marketed as, as a children's movie is so good. I mean, just the one-liners from the show were so good. Switching from Spanish to English, I loved it. But the action, the action sequences, the music, the the story, though. The story is what got me, is we took a sequel. Because you forgot, there was a Puss in Boots original movie back in, gosh, I don't even know. That was like eight years ago or something. And this here's the sequel, which no one even expected, all right? Basically, you you haven't even seen Puss in Boots since the last Shrek movie, I'm pretty sure. And you turn him from this 
vigilante who can only do stuff alone into this guy who really cares about the people around him. And that message really just translates well into the real world. And I know it's a children's movie. You're not supposed to look too deep into that, but I found that message. So shout out to Puss in Boots, Last Wish. And they tease at the end, maybe a Shrek 5. So count me up. Sign me up for that because freaking I love those movies. Those movies are iconic. I used to watch those all the time when I was little. Just on repeat, on repeat, on repeat. So Puss in Boots, Last Wish, you get a 9 out of 10. And I really get to see movies. So um, I'm happy to always be able to rank them. I actually, I might be seeing Barbie and Oppenheimer. So we might do a, try and do an in-depth review of both of those movies. And they're coming out too. And they're both highly touted. So that's a little bit of a surprise on the movie spectrum. A little TV show action. Um, Let me see. Anything else? I think I saw Stranger Things season five. They're releasing some teasers or something. I don't know if those are real or fan-made, but that's another good show that I'll. We'll have to watch and do a little uh, review on whenever it comes out. But let's get into um, a staple of this show, as always. We'll be reviewing the fight night from this past Saturday. Now, it's been, it's been a couple days by the time this episode airs, but UFC fight night, Holm versus Silva, always weird. They're always weird, weird events at the Apex, all right? And I don't get it. Maybe it's because there's not a crowd, you know? There's no one for them to really impress, but... Always weird when they're at the apex, so um, we'll dive in. Uh, let me let me check my um my stats. I believe we went yes, we went four and two. That was me throwing out my notebook. Um, we went four and two on picks for the main card, and even I don't know if anyone will believe this, but we picked every single prelim fight correctly, despite that section not being recorded for uh, episode five. So you could choose to believe me, you could choose not to believe me, but take me for my word that. We were very hot this event. If we if we bet, we'd have made some money on this event. But yeah, four and two on picks. So um, we'll dive into the whole card, go over everything. So let's start out. The the one downfall is the first official finish of the night came on the main card. So prelims, not too hot. I mean, we start off the night with Aline Perez just dominating Ashley Evans Smith. I mean, there's a reason Ashley Evans Smith is not known as the best fighter. She she's she's pretty brutal to watch. Alan Perez racks up ten takedowns for eleven minutes and thirty six seconds of control time. The most significant strike she let Ashley Evans Smith get in around was five. All right. Total significant strikes. Alan Perez sixty. Ashley Evans Smith twelve. I mean Alan Perez was on a whole other level tonight. Um I'm happy to get someone like that in the women's bantamweight division who just, they struggle. The women's bantamweight division, it's struggling, but um, I actually got, um, we got a couple, a couple of ladies moving up the rankings tonight, including in the main event. We will get to that, but we move on. All right, next up, we had Alexander Munoz beating Carl Deaton at lightweight. There's not much to say. You're probably like, who, who are these fighters, Zach? I've never heard of their names. That's why they are the second fight on the prelim. Not much to see here. Alexander Munoz gets a win. Um, he will move on to, let me get his record up here, 7-2. and two. He's now um, oh, one and 1-2 in the UFC. So he got his first UFC win. So not much to say there, honestly. I mean, we move on to what I thought was going to be the most fascinating fight. Azat Maksum versus Tyson Nam at flyweight. These, um, for anyone who did not know, since... I'm going to repeat this that since I unfortunately was not able to tell you on my last show because my prelims coverage was not captured. Asat Maksum was 16-0 and going into this fight at, oh gosh, I think he was like 27, 26 years old. He beats Tyson Nam by split decision. He's now 17-0. and Flyweight, you got a special one here. Now, the Tyson Nam fight was certainly very close, but at the end of the day, you know I... I reference Vince McMahon, I reference the authority, WWE, what's best for business. And what's best for business is Azak Maksum moving up in the flyweight division. Congrats to him. And what was maybe could have been the fight of the night had um, the rest of the fight sucked, but Evan Elder versus Gennaro Valdez next up was a banger, man. Evan Elder dropping Gennaro, Gennaro dropping Evan, just swinging at each other. And I'm very happy Evan Elder was uh, able to get a win here because, man, just unfortunate luck in both his previous fights. But he's able to get one here. He'll move on. I mean, I don't really know what's next for any of these um, 
prelim fighters. I mean, there's so many, so many different options when you're just unranked. So good job, Evan. That's for Janelle. You'll bounce back. All right. And speaking of bouncing back, Melquizel. Let me repeat that. Melquizel Costa beats Austin Lingo by unanimous decision. Lands 100 significant strikes. And after an unfortunate debut against Tiago Moises earlier this year at UFC 283, very happy to see Melquizel get back in the wing column. Uh, over someone like Austin Lingo, who he should have beat, but he has a rare skin condition. Um, I can't really recall what it is, but his pigment's kind of different around his neck, um, around his whole body, actually. And, you know, it's I'm very happy he's able to bring awareness to that while also getting wins in the UFC. So, respect to um, Mokuzel. If um, what the skin disease is comes to mind, I will bring it back up. But moving on to one of the more shocking moments of the night at Women's Strawweight. As Victoria Dudikova, who was undefeated coming into this, she stays undefeated, gets a TKO win over Estela Nunes, who brutally dislocates her elbow. Oh my goodness. I saw it get, I saw it just get brutally, brutally dislocated. And oh, it was tough to see. And before we talk about it real quick, I actually uh, remembered what the milk was out. Um, skin condition was called, it was called vitiligo, which is a chronic, long lasting autoimmune disease. You know, I had to think about that. You know, I know my stuff. All right. But back to Estella, who actually has something that could be could cause permanent damage as her entire elbow came out of socket. Oof, it was nasty. Dana was reposting it all over. It was kind of funny. But um dang, I hope Estella bounces back. But Victoria Dudikova, you move on. Not much really say here. I mean, weird stuff at the apex, all right. And uh moving into our headline prelim, Melsic Bagnasarian beats Tucker Lutz. Melsic, an excellent kickboxer. Is able to withstand the grappling of Tucker Lutz. Gets you an decision. Like I said, not much to say here for these prelims. Very lackluster. I mean, obviously on every card you're gonna find something entertaining, but nothing really nothing really too enticing about these prelims, but the main card did not lack. Lots of stuff to dive into here. We'll start off, man. Terrence McKinney had so much potential. I had the Terrence McKinney round two rear naked choke, but Nazim survives the ground on round one against Terrence. He did have some fence grabs, which were very suspicious, but Nazim manages to withstand him and in round two submits him, actually. Gets on gets on top back mount, pins his arm behind him and chokes him. Very brutal stuff. Terrence now on a two fight. Losing streak, tough for Terrence. I'm, I'm sure he'll be back. But as for Nazim, now 9-1, and 2-0 and oh in the UFC. Coming off that uh, contender series victory, so if you include that, he'd be 3-0. and oh. Very happy for Nazim. And um, he did avenge Matt Frivola, who, um, if I didn't know Matt Frivola was his teammate, um, I definitely would have picked him, for those who do not know. Terrence McKinney actually knocked Matt Frivola out in his debut in seven seconds, so. Good for Nazim. We'll see what's next for you. Um, maybe start doing some uh, more research on unranked fighters so I can actually tell you uh, who could be next for all these fighters instead of just the um, ranked ones. But yeah. Moving on to Norma Dumont versus Chelsea Chandler at Women's Featherweight. I mean, not the most, not the most entertaining, but the most entertaining moment came in round one where Norma clips, clips Chelsea very hard and Chelsea sprints across the cage. She just beelines across the cage for no reason to the other side. Very entertaining. Very funny to see. You don't see it every day. And people bring it up how stuff like that just always happens at the apex. Weird stuff like that. But besides that, Norma dominated on the ground, dominated on the feet. Just showed a clear skill advantage. And in the women's bantamweight rankings, despite never fighting at bantamweight, she fights at women's featherweight in all her fights. Norma moves up to the number 12 spot, passing Julia Avila. And Chelsea is actually ranked number 15. So is women featherweight staying around? I don't know. But as for Norma, if you're going to keep fighting featherweight type fighters, I mean, I like a Macy Chisholm fight next for Norma or even a Yana Santos. All right. I'd say Holly Holmes, but I think I have an idea of who Holly Holmes could fight next. So we'll actually save her. But I like a I like a fight like that for Norma Dumont. Very happy for Norma. 
Good job to her. And um, we move on to the last fighter, I did not predict correctly, to win. And that was Jun Young Park beating Albert Durov. And, oh, man. Very sad. I'm a fan of Albert Durov. I don't know why. I just like him. I just like Albert Durov. I like his style. But his style did not work too well tonight. As Jun Young Park manhandles him in round two, he submits him with 15 seconds. Left Jun Young Park. Wow. I don't know if he's going to move into the middleweight rankings. But, I mean, he is now on a, what is it? Is it five-fight win streak? It might even be. It's four-fight win streak. Three of those. Three naked chokeholds. So, last loss came to Gregory Rodriguez in 2021. But besides that, he's actually seven and one. His last eight. Seven and two in the UFC in total. So, the whole UFC run has been good. I've been seeing a lot of people saying he should get a ranked middleweight. Next, if I could give him a ranked middleweight, I would probably... I've seen people say Jack Hermanson. It's kind of a big jump. But I've just seen them give Sean Strickland, Abus Magomedov, and give Paul Acosta, Igor Malakasev. I don't put it past them. So I will say Jun Young Park versus Jack Hermanson next would be an amazing fight. For any UFC fans that don't know, Jack Hermanson notoriously is hit or miss. So it could be a good, good time to get Jun Young Park into the rankings. Um, as for Albert, tough loss. You move on, Albert. You move on. Nothing else much to say. Right? Let's get into the top three performances of the night and the final three fights of the night. All right. And we get our first performance bonus as Francisco, or is it Francisco Prado, who's 21. This kid's only a year older than me, knocks out Ottoman Azatir in round one. Wow. Wow, hits him with a spinning elbow, drops him, lays a beat down on him. I mean, my goodness, Francisco Prado. All, coop, all kudos to you, man. Right? And after dropping his first UFC fight, you know, at, gosh, he, he was either 21 or 20 at the time he lost that fight. And to come back and beat Ottoman, man, man, what a good feeling for him. And uh, he will now move to 12 and 1, I believe, 12 and 1. Let me double let me double check that actually, because I think it, he is twelve and one. Wow. Twelve and one. Sky's the limit for him at twenty one. Could be looking at future champion. This could have been one of his early finishes. But Francisco, very happy for you. Getting the round one finish. Let's get into honestly, this was probably the most interesting fight of the night. Not only did it win fight of the night, but it it showed us a lot about two fighters as Jack Della Madalena who is now actually ranked 13. He actually passed Ian Gary with this win. He took on Basil Hafez. Hafez. Actually, I think it is. Basil taking this fight on. Couldn't have been but five days notice or something. I mean, it was something really short. It takes him to a split decision. Wow, no one saw this coming. But Basil was an absolute dog. Goes 3 for 20 on takedowns for 6 minutes and 48 seconds of control time. So without a doubt, you had to give him one of the rounds. The three rounds you had to give to him. Now, when it came to the feet, Jack Delamalena had a clear, clear advantage. And I mean, especially in round three, he might have 10 aided him. 43 significant strikes to seven. 61 total strikes to seven. And Jack even landed a takedown. Defended nine, so... Very interesting stuff here, but Bazile showed that he belongs in the welterweight division, and I want to see him back. I want to see him back. I don't know against who. I don't know if I want to give him a ranked opponent next, but I mean, ooh, Bazile belongs. But as for what's next for Jack Della Maddalena, I think a Neil Magny fight is perfect. I think it's the perfect time for him to fight Neil Magny. A perfect gatekeeper for Jack Della Maddalena, who still wants to fight on the UFC 293 card in Sydney, Australia. We'll see if he can make that card, but... As for this fight, good job, Jack, but better job to Bazile. Taking a ranked welterweight to the limit and winning a fight. He won 50K. Good for him, right? Well, let's dive in to the main event to cap us off, all right? And all week, all week I was going with Holly Holmes. All week I'm like, let's go, Holly. Let's go, Holly. Decision for Holly. But then I switched to Myra Bueno Silva last minute, and I may have predicted her. To knock out Holly Holmes, but she got the job done nonetheless with a round two guillotine choke with 
gosh, I don't know what she just she was just squeezing her neck. She was just squeezing her head standing. It was brutal. And after dropping round one, I think, I thought Holly Holmes won round one. Pyro Bueno Silva bounces back and she's she's now number fourteen in the women's pound for pound. She's now the number three woman's bantamweight climbing seven spots in the rankings. All right, Myra Bueno Silva, ladies and gentlemen, bringing the excitement back to women's bantamweight. We finally have a new woman at the top of the women's bantamweight division. All right, and let's be real. This is more exciting than a Julia Pena, Pacquiao Pennington fight. Give Myra Bueno Silva the title shot. Give her the bounce vacant. All right, Pacquiao Pennington's a boring fighter. I think a Julia Pena, Myra Bueno Silva fight would be very good. You could even have that be a fight night headliner. I'm being dead serious, all right? Myron Bueno Silva wins the night. That's what I think is next, is a title shot. That's for Holly Holmes. She drops to number five in the women's band weight division. I think a Misha Tate fight is perfect. I've been seeing people pitch that the rematch. It would have been, oh gosh, it could be now eight years in the making by the time it happens. So I could be very happy if they do that fight, but Holly Holmes, even if you call it a career, no one would knock you for Myra Bueno Silva back in the mix. Very happy for her. Very, very happy that um, Myra Bueno Silva gets it done. And we were switching a lot of our picks. I was actually rocking with Ottoman as a tier on the, uh, I think I said by split decision on the uh, our preview show, but I actually put on verdict, if you check the Instagram, put Francisco round one knockout, so. You know I had to, you know I was switching up, trying to work stuff out, but it was an okay card. I, I give this card a, mm, probably a 6.8 out of 10. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't too hot, but it could have been way more disappointing, you know, so that's just how it goes, but we move on. Next week, actually this upcoming Saturday, we'll be in London, very exciting, two o'clock main card start as Tom Aspinall returns to take on Marcin. Bureau. Very excited to we'll do a we'll do a preview show about that. We have so much stuff to cover on the next episode. It's gonna be pure UFC based, probably. New fight announcements. Jamal Hill having to vacate his belt. Um we're actually gonna do a loyal to the belt segment, Aljamain Sterling. So very excited for that. But the main thing we uh we came to talk about on this episode is adrenaline. So I'm actually gonna take a short little break for the viewers. It will be no time. And then we're going to talk about adrenaline because this question was raised during the Dan Hooker and Jalen Turner fight by someone I know. They were like, okay, so Dan Hooker broke his, I believe it was his arm in round one, or maybe it was his hand in round one, and his orbital bone, and was able to continue fighting and get a comeback victory. How was he able to push through that? Okay, and I was thinking, okay, he just had adrenaline. And I said that, and they're like, what's adrenaline? And I thought, well, I guess I don't know entirely what adrenaline is. So I did some research. I sat down. And I'm going to let y'all know what adrenaline is. So we'll get to that in a second. And we are back. All right. Little intermission. As always, I need breaks too, to, uh, so I can collect my thoughts. So let's go over what adrenaline actually is. All information I'm getting is from the verywellhealth.com. That's what it's called. I looked up, it was very reliable, so I decided to go with it, and um, while I was thinking about Dan Hooker getting injured in the first round, I also remembered that at UFC 290, Brandon Moreno broke his hand in round one, and then managed to fight four more rounds after that, so this thing that is adrenaline, it's a mystery, but I attempted to dive into it and discover more about it, so let's go into it. So adrenaline also goes by its more professional name as epinephrine or maybe epif epiphrine i didn't actually look up how it's pronounced but it's e-p-i-n-e-p-h-r-i-n-e -E -E. so i'm gonna go with epinephrine and it is a hormone released whenever a person experiences fear anxiety stress or stress and it triggers the fight or flight response so adrenaline in itself is fight or flight, which is very fitting that UFC fighters experience this as they are involved in a fight. So, what does it do? It increases the blood circulation and your breathing. So, I'm just going to use this to correlate to UFC. So, I mean, 
when you see them breathing a lot, that's their adrenaline keeping their body moving and keeping the blood circulating throughout the body. And adrenaline also stimulates the sympathetic nervous system that regulates the body's unconscious actions. So things that you might not be aware of, for, for example, you would it would just be being done for you. Like you don't have to think about blinking. You don't have to think about breathing. I know that happens every day, but it's very in effect when you have adrenaline. And I mean, you might not even be thinking about, gosh, certain movements you're doing, you know, because you're being stimulated. And this is the, so it said, when it's released, it affects the body in six key ways. I jot down all six to go over. So number one is the airways dilate to provide muscles with oxygen. So your muscles are getting more oxygen, meaning they can move faster. So in, in fighting terms, you can punch more. You can absorb punches. Your muscles are filled more with oxygen, thanks to adrenaline. Your blood vessels also contract to redirect blood flow to major muscle groups, for example, the heart and the lungs. So this is very big for your cardio, for your heart, which is supplying blood, and you need your heart and your lungs to be able to function, and very important for a fight. Um, number three, heart rate speeds up and contracts, so oxygen is delivered to muscles and tissue. A lot of this may seem repetitive, but it, act it actually is all different. The heart rate's speeding up, and it's contracting, which is sending more oxygen to your muscles and your tissue. Tissue, very important. So, for example, if you're getting hurt, oxygen's going right to that, so you may not be feeling it at the moment, but you will in the future. Number, what are we on? Number four, causes the liver to release blood sugar, which provides the body with energy. So thus the fight or flight, either way, your body's getting energy, whether you're going to engage or you're going to flee. So, and this, also I can think about this as if you're pumping yourself up for, um, let's say you're going to a job interview, you're going to a date, even a first day of class for people, your adrenaline can get pumping and your body gets a little bit of energy just before you go in and then you're, then you're in there, all right? Number five, it causes the pupils to dilate so you can see more clearly. Very important in fighting world, very important in the UFC. Uh, being able to see, you know, especially if you've got blood dripping down into your eyes, you know, you're sweating. Uh, being able to see more clearly thanks to adrenaline. Very, very helpful. And I can think of a number of instances, you know, where fighters need to be locked in, you know, and then their pupils are dilated. They're waiting to throw. They're waiting to dodge. That's all thanks to adrenaline, right? And this was the number six of the six key ways it affects the body. And I have it starred since it was the most important, I thought, is that it reduces perception of pain. Thus, how Dan Hooker and Brian Moran were able to make it through all those rounds without collapsing out of agony. And this is due to the perception of pain being absent, such as, hmm, let's say you're on a breakaway in basketball and you may step on your ankle weird and it may twist, but you have the you have adrenaline pumping through you, so you just Basically, ignore it, go back up for the basket, and then it's as you run down the court, you start to go, something don't feel right in my ankle. Or, if we're talking more about UFC, your hand being broken, a giant cut on your face, your leg being swollen, your uh, freaking eye, your, um, gosh, what is it, your orbital bone being broken, I mean, severe stuff, so this is very important. And this perception of pain, which is reduced, it is being induced by this thing called analgesia, A-N-A-L-G-E-S-A. -A -E analgesia is actually used to treat arthritis. So this analgesia, which is released, which reduces your pain, is also used to treat arthritis. So the pain you're feeling in your hands and your feet from arthritis and your knees and your back they make drugs for that, and your body also produces it. Absolutely crazy. And, of course, we got some examples of when adrenaline can be released. For example, taking a test. I remember plenty of tests I've been nervous for. Gosh, what was, what was the most recent one? Um, it might have, I, was, I, would, I would say my calc final for my calculus class. That, that, that really had me going. Um, but usually the in-person ones 
Because, you know, when you're on your computer, you're kind of just, all right, you're just clicking, you're good. But when you're in person, you wait for everything to be passed out, then you're told to go. So maybe my criminal justice class, although I kind of ace that. So, yeah, I could be, I could be caught if I want to. No, I'm just playing. All right. It can also be released watching a scary movie. I mean, get a little jump scare, adrenaline spikes, you know, so you feel some haunting and stuff. I don't really know about the scary movies. I tend to stay away from those because of how demonic they are. But I mean, heck, if you're into scary movies, your adrenaline could be up and going all the time. All right. A big one, public speaking. Despite having a podcast, I mean, I know, I know a lot of people, including myself, that public speaking is intimidating. It's not till you're up there in the moment, kind of gelling. That's all good. And even for some people, they don't even get into a rhythm. So people are just terrified the whole time. And public speaking is a fear of many people. They'd rather do a lot more severe things than public speak. But man, I can totally see that releasing your adrenaline, right? Two more. One, going on a date, all right? I mean, come on, the first time. For anyone with a girlfriend, like myself, I mean, remember the first time you went on a date with them, how nervous you were. And if for any single people, you know, going on dates, it can be nervous. Your adrenaline gets going. You got the fight, engage in this conversation with this person. Or the flight, I can't do this, I gotta leave. Which if you're ghosting people, not the move, not the move. All right, and number five, I just had to add this, skydiving. I mean, adrenaline junkie. Then it's in the name, adrenaline junkies, who just like to do the Tom Cruise from Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning and drive their bikes off mountains. Skydiving is just one of the ultimate ways of getting adrenaline. It's because your body naturally does not want to be floating through the air out of a plane. All right, that's just not where it's meant to be, but it gives you a big release of adrenaline. All right, I'm trying to think of some of the personal experiences. Um, Some close car crashes, like slamming on the brakes, you know, actually almost being in one. Most of my friends were going down this dirt road, took a turn too fast, heading to the ditch. Driver slams on one of my friends, slams on the brakes just in front of a pole. Tell me, that gets your adrenaline going. Um... Running. Running will always get your adrenaline going. I mean, you just start sprinting, right? Especially being chased. The ultimate ultimate fight or flight is being chased. Which I guess in UFC, you can... It's basically getting... You're engaging in the fight, and the flight is running. As we uh, as we mentioned about how Chelsea Chandler sprinted away from Norman Dumont at uh, this past fight night on uh, July 15th. But yeah. Many different ways you can get adrenaline. Um, an adrenaline rush can start immediately, and it can actually last up to an hour, surprisingly. So you see these guys in the main event fighting in 25 minutes, which actually, I mean, they give them like one minute breaks in between rounds. So you're looking actually at like 30 minutes of your adrenaline just pumping, being at, being at max force. That's the adrenaline rush, all right? And there's actually symptoms of it, such as shallow and rapid breathing. So when you see the fighters in their corner, because they always show corner camps, usually unless they have ads, which always suck, you'll see the coaches, or even the trainers at times, cal calming down the fighters, telling them to breathe, and their breaths are going to be shallow, and they're going to be rapid, man. They get, they're trying to calm them down because their adrenaline is rushing. It also increases sweating. So you see them guys sweating. Um, obviously, they're moving around in a cage. They're fighting. They're grappling. That's all. Very intense stuff. But when you're under adrenaline, you're even going to sweat more, okay? And plus, anyone who's done sports, um, just being in, until you get in your rhythm, your adrenaline can be high. You know, that basketball tip-off, right? When the ball hits, I mean, you're, you're live. Kickoff for football as a batter, that first pitch, for the pitcher, the first pitch. I mean, lots of stuff in sports. And last thing, a symptom of an adrenaline is an increased ability to run or lift heavy objects so let's say you take pre-workout let's say you slam an energy drink all right then you're feeling you're kind of feeling good all right you feel like you're on top of the world but that ends but an adrenaline rush which is naturally from the body will actually allow you to lift heavier stuff and this is because i guess you can say back in caveman days if you were in a life or death situation you had to move stuff. Let's say there's a rock in your way. You got a saber-toothed tiger chasing you. You're moving that rock, all right? Let's say you're being chased by someone who wants to, with a knife who wants to kill you, and you jump to a really high fence. Let's say there's nowhere to put your feeding. You can muscle up your way over that fence just with your arms. Superhuman strength, all right? You can lift the boulders. 
I mean, I've seen people, I've, I've seen stories of people who they've seen someone or maybe they've been in a car crash and they need to get someone out and they move the car. I have seen that. And it's crazy what adrenaline can do for you. Now, I don't know how to channel it because I feel like it just happens. You have to be under stress. You have to be in certain situations. But being able to run or lift heavy objects, I mean, think about that in UFC terms. Your cardio is going to be up. You're going to be able to engage longer. And for those who are takedown specialists, it's easier to pick up and slam your opponent. All right? And once you're on, gosh, once you have someone on the ground and half guard, top mount, back control, you can just go to town on them with the fists and you can finish it out. Adrenaline is a very interesting thing, and I didn't, I just did not realize that, you know, as I'm researching it, I feel like I'm almost reading what happens during a UFC fight. And I'm like, adrenaline is such a major part of the sport, and you just don't really think about it. So, kudos to uh, the person who posed that question, and shout out to Dan Hooker and Brandon Moreno, fought on UFC 290, which is now two weeks ago, who both channeled their adrenaline to get the win. Ladies and gentlemen, adrenaline, we all have it. It's a very special thing, right? And that's that's what we have for this episode. Um, a big UFC episode coming um tomorrow, coming on Friday. We're a bit behind, but no worries. Nonetheless, all episodes will come out. But I'm going to leave you all with an inspirational quote. I, I, I came up with it, but um, I don't know. I was just pondering on it, and I um I figured I'd put it in the video. All right, in this day and age. It's easier to be negative than it is to be positive. So be that positive in the world that is so rare. Maybe like Zach, why are you why are you hitting me with these sappy motivational quotes? You know, because I just be I'm going through my day, I'd be seeing contractors, I'd be going to people's houses, and people are just so negative. They just find the littlest things like my my job was supposed to be started five days ago. Or you forgot this on the order. I had to go bring it. Or even like, this doesn't look like it was put in right, right? But you gotta find the positives in everything. You break your foot. It sucks. It's not fun at all. You know, no one wants to break their foot. But you have to ask yourself, okay, I broke my foot. Why? Why did I break my foot? How could I turn this into a positive? What was I neglecting when I had a foot that I can now appreciate when I have my foot back when it's healed? Or even now that I... Have a boot on, not to deal with it, you know? It's all about finding the positives in life. And that's why I try and be nice to every single person I meet. I always like to greet people, smile, spread that positivity. Because we only live once. We have to treasure it every single day. All glory to God. All right? That's enough of my little motivational spiel. Hope everyone was uh, entertained by my little adrenaline conversation. That's your surprise topic of this episode. I guess it won't be a surprise. It's in the title. But I mean, we went over a little bit of Too Hot to Handle, a little bit of Puss in Boots. kind of wanted to cover those a bit more, but maybe we'll do a movie-themed episode, TV show-themed episode coming up. We also went over the UFC Fight Night Holmes versus Silva recap. Actually, what are we on the all-time? I uh, don't actually have what I am. I'll have to do that, but I think, I think I'm, actually, let me do some quick math, all right? I'm actually 443. And 325 all time in picks. All right, that's very impressive. So, next episode, we'll be going over lots of UFC news, including a fight night preview of Aspinall versus Tybura, along with our picks. And lastly, as I mentioned, the adrenaline topic. Hope everyone enjoyed. I love doing that. We're going to be researching some other conspiracy theories, some other physics, chemistry related stuff. I hope everyone was entertained, surprised. And, of course, hit with a jab of your day UFC. Everyone have an amazing evening. God bless.